There are so many Halo levels I adore, too many to list in fact, but for all the series high points there are a few miserable missions too. Today it's those stinkers I want to focus on as I run through the 10 examples I least look forward to revisiting, ending with what I think is the franchise's worst. I know this list is also going to be a wee bit controversial, so it is worth noting that it's just my opinion and is by no means gospel, and also I'd love to hear your thoughts regarding which Halo level make your blood boil, so do let me know in the comments after watching. When Halo Infinite was announced as an open world title, I was hesitant. When some said its map and the content contained within it were nothing like Far Cry or other similarly styled titles, I was relieved. When I finally played the game and realised even some parts of the campaign fell foul of the stagnant, spiritless open world design so prevalent in modern gaming, I was extremely discouraged. Infinite's level The Sequence, number 10 on my list, is in my eyes the worst offender. The name of the game is fairly straightforward. In order to reconstruct a Forerunner sequence and enter one of their spires, you need to visit and activate four separate energy beacons. It is precisely as tedious as it sounds. You travel a long way until you reach one of them, kill the enemies outside it, head inside and watch one of the million cutscenes Infinite includes, depicting the weapon chattering away while standing at a terminal. Then you do the same thing three more times. The enemies outside each of them may change to provide a different challenge each time, but otherwise there's little difference between them. What makes it worse is that the justification for doing so is complete and utter techno babble, which amounts to little more than a futuristic spin on the age-old go here and collect X number of items or kill X number of enemies you see in so many open world games and it is the furthest thing possible from what I personally desire from Halo. I've mentioned my misgivings regarding the sequence in the past and some have said that while it may be a tad contrived it's as much a way of getting you to explore the map as anything else. In response, I ask you this. If the only thing really pushing you to spend time getting to know the ins and outs of Zeta Halo is mission design ripped straight from a 1990s role-playing game, what is the point in including that open world in the first place? For all its strengths, and Halo Combat Evolved has many strengths, it also has a problem with repetition during its second half. Penultimate Mission Keys is the worst manifestation of that issue, which is why it's here in ninth place. Its opening section I'm not a massive fan of as you fight your way through canyons against both Flood and Covenant, but it's nowhere near as bad as what follows. You spend most of your time during Keys traversing the halls of a Covenant ship, much like in Truth and Reconciliation earlier, except this time the halls are chock full of Flood. However, the Flood don't really work well as an enemy when encountered in narrow hallways, nor do they tend to flourish when they are a level's primary antagonist. Fighting the Covenant in a confined space is no big deal. You might have to dodge the odd grenade or backpedal every so often when at low health, but it's all manageable. Fighting the Flood under similar circumstances is a never-ending nightmare. Grenades, a handy tool for clearing large groups of enemies, are quickly proven to be useless as the risk of them causing a chain reaction with other grenades and flood carrier forms is too high. Sticking to guns doesn't make things any better either. You'll likely take down a carrier form regardless, at which point it exploding will cause a chain reaction anyway, or you'll quickly be swamped as what seems like a non-stop procession of space zombies surrounds you from every which way. It's the complete opposite of what made a lot of Combat Evolve's first half so marvellous, and consequently is especially jarring as you've already had a taste of the sweet, sweet honey that is the game at its best. If I was talking about my favourite story beats in the series, Keys might well make the list thanks to the horrifying story of the titular captain being consumed by the Flood. As it stands, it is instead the gameplay equivalent of that. It's an incredibly painful ordeal and you'll likely be driven out of your mind as you're slowly enveloped by the Flood. Finishing 8th in my ranking is Halo Combat Evolves the Library, a level which takes all of Bungie's hard work during previous Mission 343 Guilty Spark and sort of ruins it. The Library is the dictionary definition of the word slog. 
After its first encounter or two, you might be tricked into thinking you're having a good time as you cut down waves of flood in what is ostensibly a creepy, unique environment. But then you do the same thing again, and again, and again, until an experience that at first felt unusual begins to feel rather run-of-the-mill. And then it just keeps on going past that point until run-of-the-mill is but a distant memory. You enter an area which looks the same as all the other areas you've explored, and then you fight a group of flood who are much the same as every other group of Flood you fought. Any mystique surrounding your new enemy quickly evaporates, replaced by little more than indifference, which is the worst reaction you could possibly have. Oh, and there are Flood equipped with rocket launchers to contend with too, and dealing with them often feels like an exercise in futility, especially on higher difficulties. The library is also far, far too long. If it were 10 minutes or so in length, I think Halo might have got away with it, but its hefty runtime absolutely destroys the campaign's pacing. Everything up to the Flood's reveal is varied and moves at a steady pace, and then comes the introduction of the Flood, which marks a major paradigm shift. But then, during the library, everything slows to a crawl, a shift in tempo felt acutely after the shocking crescendo which precedes it. The great shame about the library is that you can see what Bungie was trying to accomplish, or at least what I think they were trying to accomplish. After being introduced to the Flood during 343 Guilty Spark, this was the mission that was meant to establish how dangerous a foe they are to help you better understand the scale of the threat they pose. Bungie simply goes too far in their attempts to do so, and ultimately creates something which is overlong and underwhelming in equal measure. As much as I love the Arbiter, the pair of levels which introduce him as a playable character are second rate. The Oracle, though, is by far and away the worst of this gruesome twosome, which is why it sits in seventh. On paper, the Oracle certainly sounds exciting. The Flood are reintroduced, and you have to deal with them while also trying to assassinate the leader of the Heretics, but what promises so much delivers so little. Topping the reveal of the Flood in 343 Guilty Spark was always going to be a tall order, but you have to give Bungie some kudos for at least trying. The result, however, is mixed. There are one or two interesting hints at their arrival early doors, and although it's pretty obvious that they're about to join the fray and make life difficult for you, there is at least a smidgen of tension built up. Unfortunately, that's about as good as the Oracle gets. After bringing down a first group of Flood, you get to take part in what is for my money the joint most appalling slow-moving platform section in Halo 2, tied with that at the end of Quarantine Zone, and it being so noticeably bad is really saying something given the extraordinary amount of them dotted throughout the game's campaign. It's one of those sections that gives real insight into how Rush 2's development must have been, as no one in their right mind would play it, think it was anything better than dreadful, and decide to leave it unchanged if there was any amount of time remaining to fix it. The rest of the Oracle is middling too. The best of it is the sequence which tasks you with cutting a set of cables, but everything surrounding that brief moment of okayness is deeply uninteresting. It's mostly just battles with the Flood, heretics or sentinels, or a combination of them in boring environments, capped off with a boss fight which feels out of place in a series like Halo. It's a shame Bungie weren't Oracles themselves, as then they would have perhaps foreseen how rubbish the Oracle would end up being. Slotting in at number 6 is Halo's Midnight, quite possibly the least riveting final level in any Halo campaign full stop. Granted, it does start out reasonably well, as you whiz through space piloting a broadsword hot on villain the Didact's heels. It's Call of Duty fair more than it is a traditional Halo vehicle sequence, but it's entertaining enough. The problem is basically everything else which follows. Considering Midnight is meant to be Halo 4's climax, the culmination of everything which happened during its previous seven levels, you'd think there would be a bit more to it. Again, you have the broadsword section to open things, but then you're right back to fighting hordes of Prometheans for what feels like forever. They are dull to the nth degree, and you will likely already be completely sick of them by the time you reach this portion of the game. Nothing, nothing about Midnight's middle and latter stages screams, this is nearly the end of the game, time to get excited. You traverse more Forerunner structures, which include little variation on top of those you've already fought your way through multiple times, and you also get to take part in a brief waved-based encounter which kills any sense of pacing Midnight might have had stone dead. 
do not get me started on its ending either, as it is pitiful. I've never been a huge proponent of boss fights in Halo games, I generally don't think they're handled well and so should be avoided, but there needed to be something, anything, other than you pressing a button or two before watching the didact fall down a hole. A few touching final moments shared between Chief and Cortana cap things off, but even that has been retroactively sullied thanks to 343 not being able to stick to their guns in story terms. Midnight does exactly what the final level in a video game shouldn't do. It leaves you underwhelmed and not wanting more, and for that heinous crime, it wholeheartedly earns its slot in this video. Out of all the levels I'm going to talk about, Cortana might have the coolest concept of them all. After witnessing the fall of Covenant Holy City High Charity first-hand during Halo 2's latter stages, you find yourself back there again towards the end of 3, on a mission to rescue Cortana. Unfortunately, it manages to bumble its way into fifth place because it's ghastly, not in the scary way, but in the really bad way. If you like the colours orange and yellow, and you like everything in your video games to be those colours, then you are going to have a whale of a time. High Charity is covered in flood biomass of those colours, and the flood are those colours too, which means the level is a complete mess visually. Even if you can get around those issues with the visuals, or as mentioned you've got a real passion for yellow and orange, the level design will no doubt trip you up as well. As they usually do, the flood tend to come from everywhere, and so you spend a lot of of time rotating around nondescript areas, which results in it being exceedingly difficult to navigate an environment often free of any landmarks to orientate yourself to. From a gameplay perspective, the whole experience is unbelievably repetitive. Then you have the Cortana and Gravemind interruptions, which regularly slow you to a near halt. Irritating doesn't even begin to describe them. They happen many times throughout the rest of Halo 3's campaign too, but nowhere are they more prevalent than in Cortana. You do at least manage to rescue Cortana, and the scene with her is touching, but it comes far too late in the campaign. She is the second most important character in the series after Master Chief, and yet you barely get to spend any time with her. I get that that's not the mission's fault per se, but I do think I'd feel a little less aggrieved by the situation situation if the level you rescued her during was of a much higher quality. You know a level is bad when the Anniversary Edition's opening cinematic includes a very obvious mistake which the development team couldn't be bothered to fix. I don't blame them either. If I was part of the team remastering Halo 2, I'd also want to spend as little time as possible working on Sacred Icon. I imagine it won't be a huge shock to many of you to see this mission in fourth place in this video. After all, it's one I often cite as being a wasted opportunity by Bungie. Combine Sacred Icon with Quarantine Zone to form one larger level, and you could have had a flood-based take on Assault on the Control Room, a level which would alleviate much of the distress I feel when playing both. The sacred icon we do get is all filler and no killer. You go toe to toe with vast numbers of Flood and Sentinels, the least two entertaining factions to face off against, moving through areas that have a tendency to repeat themselves. While it does have a bit more variety than something like the library, it doesn't have that much more. So while in Combat Evolved you could make the excuse that Bungie were still finding their footing with the series, you'd expect issues with repetition to be stamped out in a sequel. As you reach the mission's second half and continue your journey deeper into the facility, the environment also becomes more flood infested, which might appeal to some, but all it really means is that you get to brawl with the flood some more, except it's harder to spot them in the distance. On top of all of this, Sacred Icon is one of the least memorable levels in the series when it comes to the musical side of things, and you'll go long stretches without hearing any at all. At the end of the day, Sacred Icon is uneventful, uninspiring, and unimaginative, adding little, if anything, of value to Halo 2's campaign. If someone had told me prior to 4's release that I was finally going to be able to fly a pelican for the first time, disregarding the easter egg in Halo Reach's New Alexandria, my response would have been, I cannot wait, stick me in that cockpit right blooming now. What a shame then that it's such an anti-climax and that it's part of the third level in my ranking shutdown, which is also a bit pants. Now, I do have to take my hat off to 343 Industries for one thing. The cutscene detailing Master Chief and Cortana's conversation about what it means to be human is tremendous. But then, everything goes downhill rapidly. 
Flying the Pelican between objectives is a real letdown with it not being much fun to fly and combat using it being fundamentally uninteresting. Within the context of the series, it also feels like a step back. Apologies for rabbiting on about New Alexandria, but Bungie really outdid themselves, creating an amazing aesthetic and introducing twists to Halo's traditional gameplay in the form of randomization. In Shutdown, you just fly across sterile skies from Forerunner Tower to Forerunner Tower, occasionally indulging in some low-octane combat. The rest of the mission isn't much to write home about either. If you thought slow-moving platform sections were a thing of the past, you'll soon learn otherwise as you're forced to endure one of the worst in the series, and as if that wasn't enough, it's also a sequence full to the brim with Prometheans, by far the worst antagonist Halo's ever seen. You do get to fight some Covenant, which takes the edge off a little, and you also get to again fly, but this time in a Banshee. However, all that serves to do is highlight how much less enjoyable flying the Pelican earlier was. If the right tweaks had been made, Shutdown had the potential to be a high point in Halo 4. As it stands, it undoubtedly crashes and burns. When it comes to Halo, I think what sometimes gets you is the hope. Prior to the release of every new entry to the series that has come out in recent years, I've convinced myself that maybe, just maybe, it will be the one that restores the franchise to its former glory. Osiris, Halo 5's first mission, pretty much obliterated any enthusiasm I had for its campaign almost immediately, and that is a big part of why it takes second place. It feels like a real statement of intent from 343 Industries, but unfortunately it isn't the right statement in any way, shape or form. A mess of action that overloads the senses, words which describe a fair bit of Halo 5 honestly, it is absolutely nonsensical and does an awful job of establishing what is going on or why those events are so important. Its opening cutscene might be some people's bag with its Marvel movie-esque cinematography and bombastic tone, but it's way too much for me straight off the bat, and what follows is really rather poor. Osiris's skybox is impressive to this day, I will give it that, and the level design is fine, but everything else is basically Halo 4 again, but messier, which isn't at all a compelling proposition. Everything occurring at ground level is about as by the numbers as could be, and of course no 343 developed Halo mission is complete without a mind-numbing trek through a forerunner structure, so one of those is thrown in during its second half as well. If you thought its story could end up being its saving grace regardless, you're quickly proven wrong again too, with Jewel and Dharma, a character who really should have remained a part of the story for at least a little while longer, killed off in record time. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, but I reckon kicking Halo 5 off with the level blue team before transitioning into Osiris would have made its action far more palatable, but it's not the second mission in the game, and so it's probably my least favourite opening level in the entire series. Series. Taking home the title of Worst Level in Halo, the number one that is no fun is The Breaking. The Breaking takes all the most egregious parts of Halo 5, the repetitive, uninspired forerunner architecture, linear Call of Duty style combat and bullet sponge boss fights, and dials them up to 11, in the process creating an unholy cocktail of awfulness I despise with a burning passion. What bothers me most about it is that it takes Halo's wonderful combat and encounter design and twists them into something almost unrecognisable. Every encounter is a war of attrition, and every one of them unfortunately falls identically. You enter a grey, uninspiring area, a lot of grey, uninspiring Prometheans spawn ahead of you, and you then begin to push forward, often at a glacial pace, desperately trying to thin your enemy's ranks as you fire endlessly into an absurd amount of bad guys. There's very little <clears throat> breaking up the monotony either. Once in a blue moon, you might get the odd Cortana-related story beat to add the faintest of silver linings to an otherwise extremely dark cloud, but they're fleeting at best and aren't enough to make things bearable. How can I forget about the face-off with the Warden too, which is the definition of anticlimactic? Fighting one manifestation of him is more than enough, but for whatever madcap reason, 343 Industries decides to chuck three of them into the mix, and it's just as terrible as it sounds. 
It's also the second to last level in its campaign, and that makes it one of the most important in the game. However, at a time when 343 should have been ramping up the excitement ahead of a final showdown with Cortana, you're instead served a stark reminder of why 5 could be so disappointing. Reaching the final part of the game, you should be amped up and raring to see things through, not breathing a sigh of relief at the thought of it almost being over. The breaking may be the penultimate level in 5's campaign, but in my rankings it goes above and beyond, finishing in a very well deserved last place. Thanks for watching the video, boys, girls and Spartans. If it was more entertaining than some of the levels included in this video, do consider liking, subscribing and letting me know what your ranking would look like, and hopefully we'll meet again soon.